either a molecule is there or a molecule is not there, and that's not what you want. You want a point that is a um, point, meaning a, a dimension uh, which is small enough for you to think of it as a point when you are thinking about a fluid flow. For example, you have a one centimeter pipe, um, you think of a little volume which may be a few nanometers in size, something like that, but that's point for you for all practical purposes. But it has many molecules in it. So you are sort of averaging the motion of many molecules in order to say that's a point for you in fluid dynamics. The same as you do in any solids and anything like that. So a point therefore is not a literal point, but it's a small enough volume that you can regard it as a point for all practical purposes, but it still contains large enough molecules that you can do a sensible averaging of those things. Okay, so that's what you mean by saying that you have a, a point in, in space. When you say velocity at this point in space, um, that point is, uh, is to be regarded as something like that. And then when you say you have a fluid, uh, little fluid element, that's also what it means. It has many um, molecules in that fluid element uh, that you are averaging over all of them. And so, uh, molecules have random motion generally associated with them and you have a certain distribution and uh, they also could move in addition to this random motion, they can also have a superposed directional velocity. So when you average over molecules which have this directionality superposed on these fluctuations, that's when you have a fluid element with a certain velocity. Otherwise, if you have a, let's say, a tank in which you have water and water is sitting still, the molecules are moving about still, but you take the average over a small volume, all the molecules are executing random motion, but it'll give you zero average, so the fluid velocity is zero. But if you now somehow put a piston on top of the tube and push the fluid from one end to the other end of the tube, then there's a linear motion you have superimposed on these molecules and that's what you will get as the velocity. Now the random motion is related to the uh, temperature of the, of the uh, uh, well, temperature in, in some sense. That's what gives rise to the te so-called temperature in the, in the conventional continuum sense. Uh, and it's um, it's the mean square of the distribution gives you some uh, measure of it. And if you want to talk about pressure, for instance, on a surface, um, what happens is the molecules uh, will bombard on the surface and on the average leave a certain force. You divide the force by area and let the area element go to zero, that's when you get the pressure. So these are the concepts which are just basic averages on large number of molecules um, that uh, may be present. So when you go to space, for instance, let's say uh, a few kilometers up, uh, then you have um, molecules that are not exactly colliding each, with each other because of, the, because of the, their rare uh, occurrence. And then you have to consider the molecular motion and not talk about fluid as a continuum. Or when you have um, another situation with the very vacuums or similar things like that, when you really have to consider the motion of separate molecules. In principle, if you can actually carry out the analysis over all molecular motions, and then average, you will get the velocity. In fact, a lot of people do just that. You know what the equations are that govern the motion of molecules or atoms, and uh, then you evolve them using that equation, um, average over it, but that is too expensive and too, uh, too time consuming. So you sort of 
um, uh, uh, take a shortcut uh, in describing these fluid uh, motions like this, like the one we are talking about. Okay, so that's uh, one thing that was my, was maybe perhaps not obvious, and uh, I was saying, in general. Uh, I don't know how many of you know the concept of stability. It's extremely important concept, but how many of you know what stability means? Yeah, I uh, I give, uh, give up on the people in the front row, <laughs> so and you as well. So, so stability basically um, is a very important concept. Um, you have a certain a state uh, described by whatever variables you are interested in, uh, pressure, velocity, temperature, etc. And then you have something in front of you, an object in front, uh, which is described by certain variables. It may be very simple like the position of uh, this uh, piece of uh, chalk sitting here. And uh, what I can do is if I perturb it a tiny amount. See, it's uh, perturbed and it moves back. Now it's back to where it was. Now that's uh, perfectly stable. If, of course, I uh, give a heavier perturbation, that's no longer so. I do no longer have a, uh, the perturbation dying to give you uh, the basic state. It's just moved into a new state of motion, or new state in this case of rest. Now, so, the concept is one of a basic state, which in this case is this. And then a perturbation that you might uh, give, I'm scared, of, okay, so that's a perturbation. And then the perturbation has died down. The perturbation has died down because of friction, uh, presumably, right? The air around it is trying to block the motion. The surface at the bottom is trying to restrain the motion. So altogether, because of that, the perturbation has died down and you have, you have this. So in a fluid flow, it is the same, except that you have a continuum a medium. So um, I have, let's say, uh, a, a, a plate or something like that, something like this, a surface, and I blow air on it, let's say, at some steady state. And that um, is not as simple a state as the one I just talked about but it is uh, going uniformly and smoothly over this plate. And that is my basic state. It's no perturbation attached to it. It's smooth, steady in time and everything. And now, uh, without all these other things on it, of course. And now, say, I shake that flow like that for a little bit. I might shake it for a short amount of time and ask um, uh, uh, the state of the perturbation I put in. Or I might do that, I might just uh, keep doing that. You know, I keep doing perturbing like this all the time. And I ask whether the perturbation I put in there, as the fluid is moving, is it growing or is it decaying? Okay, that's one type of question I can ask. So here I am constantly putting in a perturbation at a frequency, and then I want to know whether it decays or not. If it decays, then I can say that the basic state that was that original flow which was smooth and steady on this surface, uh, I could say it was steady, it was stable. On the other hand, if I uh, do it uh, like that here, and I measure it here and it is like that, you know, much bigger, or it's doing something like that, for instance, or it's doing like that, then clearly the flow has lost its stability, and I no longer have what I had here, there, and there, etc. It might grow initially a little bit, and then it might decay. Um, usually, stability is one of um, asymptotic behavior, that is, behavior for long times. Or I might do another thing, which is to say, uh, I check the um, whole table at a certain frequency, you know, I can, the whole thing, uh, not just locally here, but it's moving like that, and I ask myself, well, what happens to it as a function of time? Um, will it, uh, will it grow, or 
<laughs> will it not go? That's not a very good example, but basically um, that is uh, the two kinds of questions. One is you put a perturbation locally in space, but but uh, uh, with a frequency, and then you ask whether it will grow or not. And another one is you can put a spatial uh, periodic perturbation, and then you can ask what happens to uh, that as a function of time. Now, usually you have put in periodic perturbations on the flow because there is a thought in the back of your mind that every perturbation in principle can be Fourier analyzed and you can always pick the one uh, frequency mod um, and, and, and you sort of ask what happens as a function of frequencies, you sweep the frequency, uh, things like that. Um, and, uh, but uh, a more general question will be, you put a um, temporally uh, transient perturbation uh, which is uh, which is very concentrated in space as well, and you ask what happens to that perturbation. Will it grow? Will it decay, etc.? So that's the kind of questions people ask in stability. So if the perturbation is small, uh, is small so that the nonlinear terms are zero, that is to say, um, let's say I have a basic uh, state like that, you know. Oh, by the way, um, when I, when I uh, wrote uh, here flow between parallel plates and I said it's parabolic like that, uh, maybe it's not clear to you what I was saying. So let's say there is flow through here, through the pipe, and uh, the velocity that you measure at the surface is zero because the fluid sticks to the surface and the surface is not moving. But if you are a little bit away from the surface, the fluid is moving. It is moving at a certain speed like that. And if I go a little bit further out, it's further away from the wall, so it is moving a little bit faster like that. And at the center, it's moving fastest. And uh, by symmetry, it is the same kind of thing. And what I'm doing is I'm attaching all these uh, magnitude vectors of the velocity and saying that's the profile, the profile of the flow. So if you somehow put in a bit of dye here, for instance, that dye piece will have moved that much here, this dye piece will have moved there and there and so on, it will give you that shape. So that's the basic state. So in another flow, the basic state may be very different. For example, if I have flow on a plate, like the one I was telling you, the flow, uh, I, I don't even want to draw that. The, flow, the fluid will be moving at zero velocity here, and the velocity will grow as you go up here. So it will go like that, like that, and it might do something like that. So that will be the basic state. Or if I have a tank in which I have water or something, like this one here, this tank, I put it there. Uh, let's take that one. Uh, the basic state is velocity is zero everywhere. It's a trivial basic state, but that's the basic state. And so a perturbation like that, or any type of perturbation, will just ask what happens to the, to the basic state. So here, I might put in uh, different types of perturbations and ask what happens to that. So um, uh, generally, as I said, you put in periodic perturbation for simplicity, not because that is the only thing to do. And you might do that, let us say, for example, um, uh, let me backtrack. If you want to do any stability analysis, you have to know what kind of perturbation you have put in. You have to have good control on the perturbation you put in. If you don't know what perturbation you have put in, you don't know to what kind of perturbations the flow is stable and to what kind of perturbations it is unstable, right? For example, if I had this here sitting, uh, it's no longer sitting, um, then if I don't tell you the magnitude of the perturbation I put in, but simply tell you, well, it falls in some cases, it doesn't fall in some others, it doesn't tell you very much. So you have to have good control. And the way you do a controlled perturbation is somehow find a way 
of um, making this velocity here. It, see, if I measure the velocity there as a function of time, it is this constant magnitude, right? So it'll be a steady number like that as a function of time. This magnitude is equal to this magnitude, okay? Now I put a perturbation which is sort of like that, let's say on it. In other words, it will measure the function of time, go back and forth and back and forth like that. Somehow I want to do that, and there may be many ways in which you can do. For example, you might have a ring on the surface here, you know, um, that's the cross section, and you might have a ring on the surface and somehow electromagnetically force it in and out, or you heat it a little bit periodically using electromagnetic forces, and then it'll give you some flow uh, perturbations uh, like that. Okay, that's how you do it. So always, uh, when you put in a perturbation, the question you're always asking is, will the perturbation die out or will it, will it somehow amplify? If it amplifies, then uh, it, instead of being like that, it might be like that, you know? <coughs> or it may very well be that at some point it'll break down and it may be some very complex uh, thing like that. So that's, if, if it happens that it is complex, then that's what you might loosely call turbulence or turbulence has set in. In the other case, when the thing has just grown like that without these oscillated little things, then all you can say is it has become unstable and somehow uh, perturbations have grown. Now how do the perturbations grow? Where do they get their energy from? They get energy from this basic flow. So the total kinetic energy of the system has to remain the same unless you, you do something else. And so presumably um, this shape will uh, adjust itself somehow slightly. But as long as the perturbations are small, say 1% or something like that, if it is 1%, then the kinetic energy will be uh, 0, 1 squared or different. And you can't see that usually. It's a very small, small kind of thing, okay? So that's the uh, basic idea. Um, and uh, somehow these perturbations, when they're unstable, they extract the energy from the flow itself, uh, from the basic flow. And it's like, um, um, you know, young children uh, siphoning off a little bit of the bank balance from the parents who are very rich, they don't even notice it. Um, so that's what happens here. The basic flow has a lot of energy to it, and the perturbations are very small. Therefore, the energy that is pumped into the perturbation is not seen uh, too much by way of change of the basic state, and you basically say it is, doesn't change at all. Um, of course, Eventually, it is all uh, coming down to molecules and things like that, but it is better not to think about it, uh, uh, at least for some of these purposes to, of molecules. But that's the idea of uh, basic flow of perturbations and things like that. Uh, what else uh, do you want to know? Yeah? Sir, so what is the physical meaning of mode of stability? Suppose you keep it chopped there. So how can you calculate the different modes of stability? Yeah, well, mode is simply, uh, you might say, a, a very rough uh, description of um, some decomposition. For example, uh, if you have one Fourier mode, that is to say one frequency or one um, wave number, then you say it is one mode. If it is a combination of two, uh, then you will say there's two modes in it. Uh, that's a very rough way of saying it. Uh, but the, modes, the word mode is used for many other things as well, but basically that is the idea. So if you have many modes, you uh, obtain the Fourier representation, then it will have non-zero amplitudes in more than one, uh, one frequency. So you will say it has some modes, uh, several modes to it. So if you have, uh, let's say, to start with, a periodic perturbation, um, either in time or space, you call this uh, one mode, let's say. And after a little while, for instance, it may just happen that uh, this may 
this may um, this may do that let's say like that okay so if it does that uh, exactly at this uh, same frequency and so on nothing has changed the mode is the same except its amplitude has grown on the other hand what it might do is let's say um, uh, oh, okay I, I'm not sure how I should say it let's say it does it alternate alternately like that okay like that um, and now what it has done is uh, at twice the frequency it has picked up a little amplitude so in the original case the Fourier representation is say frequency here f1 that just stayed there amplitude it just increased a little bit now what's happened is at 2 f1 it has picked up a little amplitude so it's you say it has two modes and there are many other ways in which it can pick up the modes uh, many modes you have told me that sir, in some perturbation grows in the cell and after some time they die out. Yes. Then sir, if it is stable. Yeah. yeah. Sir, then how it die out by itself? If it grows, then yeah. what conditions that make it die out? Yeah. So uh, what um, will happen is uh, there is always viscosity for a fluid. Um, viscosity simply is a manifestation of. Um, uh, the um, the loss of um, uh, let's say um, uh, well uh, let's let's uh, let me not explain that to you in molecular terms but let's say viscosity there is a viscosity to the flow so uh, you uh, you know, know this by example you drink tea every day you stir the uh, thing with uh, with a spoon and you take the spoon out and lo and behold your all this thing you created the the whirlpool and everything has vanished and why does it do that because the fluid that is your coffee or tea or whatever has a certain viscosity attached to it viscosity means continuum uh, um, interpretation is one fluid element will slow down the motion of the neighboring fluid element and now, if that is the case, then you can imagine what may happen. I mean, this is not exactly the only way it might happen. So, um, there is this layer here that is always slowing down everything. The, the surface is fixed and it is not moving. Therefore, it is always slowing down the uh, fluid uh, uh, elements on it. And above it, it slows down. Above that, slows down a little bit less, etc. So that kind of uh, gradient you have set up there will enable you to dissipate the energy of the uh, fluctuations, and that's how it will grow. It will grow mainly by viscosity. Sir, but viscosity, they always been there. But initially, it, it grows, sir. Uh, well, when what it viscosity is always present. So every action has to act against viscosity but somehow uh, sometimes uh, you the perturbation can extract energy from the basic state much more efficiently than can be killed by viscosity you see it's always a balance between the two so i wrote down uh, this thing here so de dt it's a rate of change of the energy of the perturbation i had things like p minus d uh, with the 1 over R or something like that, are you here? So this says how efficiently the energy can be extracted from the basic flow. This tells you how fast it can, or how much it can, at what rate it can dissipate by viscous action. And if the balance is positive, then it will grow. If the balance is negative, then it will not grow. The whole idea of the stability analysis is because this P and D depend upon both the basic state and the fluctuations, okay? Um, it depends upon what kind of basic state I have and what kind of perturbation I put on it. And somehow the whole analysis would depend on um, how you can compute this and compute that, and that is a matter of detail, I and mean, that's what you have to do by hard work. You have to know what the basic state is. It may be simple like this or maybe more complicated. 
and then you, what kind of perturbation you have, um, whether it is periodic or, uh, you know, very um, robust things like you kick it, let's say, uh, with your foot, and then whatever the perturbation is. So uh, all of that will have to go into computing this P and D, and that will tell you whether the flow is perturbation, uh, per dying or not. If the if this is zero, which is the case when you leave the perturbation, then it can only decay. It can only decay, as this one says. Um, there is, there may be enough enough production to balance it, and a little bit more, and then it will grow like uh, e to the power uh, whatever p minus d divided by some other thing. Initially, p is larger, but right. Yeah. Yeah. After some time, yeah. it gets smaller. Yeah, that's right. It could, yeah. It could. Yeah. And that is the way it will initially grow and then decay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see if there are any questions related to this, and I'll come back to Reynolds number. Do you have any questions on stability and uh, what we mean uh, uh, by? A fluid flow and things like that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Into heat. Yeah. Uh, to your perturbation. Uh, it's we are not talking about turbulence yet, but uh, any perturbation. Turbulence is a, a very complex perturbation. It's uh, think of it like that. It may be very simply a periodic perturbation and things like that. So therefore, let's simply say it's energy that is extracted from the basic flow and put into the perturbation. Only from the basic flow. From the basic flow, because there is no other source by which it can actually do that, uh, unless you are somehow introducing uh, continually the energy into the system which you are not doing it by design. Now, um, uh, so how does uh, this uh, come about, this dissipation? Uh, for example, if I have a basic flow like that, this fluid layer is moving a little bit slower than this fluid layer, and it is moving a little bit faster than this fluid layer. So they are rubbing against each other in some sense. And uh, you know that's friction, and that is what uh, eventually uh, creates a dissipation. Now, usually, this is relatively small because these profiles are very smooth and the gradients are very small. But if I have a, if I have a very strong perturbation like that, very highly variable perturbation, the gradients are so large compared to the gradients before, so your dissipation just grows up uh, tremendously. Okay, in fact, in turbulence, where such fluctuations are the rule, the dissipation is so large compared to what you may have in a laminar flow, uh, that what that's what gives rise to bigger pressure drop, higher drag on aircraft, and things of that sort. Okay. So uh, that's that, and uh, uh, you wanted to have some idea of the Reynolds number. So um, how you get the Reynolds number, uh, I could say it at different levels, but let's say I have the equation which is um, du dt. Uh, if you don't like this one, uh, uh, you can forget it for now, but uh, so minus um, dp dx plus nu, which is the viscosity times, uh, says so something like that. I, it's not a full equation, but that's where it is. Now here, you, you understand the meaning of this. You have a fluid element, and that's changing with time, so it's the rate of change of momentum with time. Uh, uh, u is the momentum because you multiply by rho, it's the moment, it's a, the rho is mass per unit volume, this is the velocity, therefore it's the kinetic energy per unit uh, volume, 
and I simply omit rho because it's a constant. You can always think about it in your head, but basically. So uh, this is rate of change of momentum with time of a fluid particle, but this here is telling you that the fluid's momentum is changing, fluid particle, not simply because things are changing with time, but also because a fluid parcel can go from here to there, and there the momentum is different from here, and in the process its momentum can change, okay? This is therefore called the advection term. Advection simply means um, it is moving, uh, is moving about. Uh, I don't want any. I'll uh, have the biscuits, however. I need some uh, energy. But coffee, please uh, take it away. I don't want it. Um, so, so that's that. And this is the pressure gradient. A pressure gradient simply is telling you a fluid particle, if you push it, it can acquire momentum. Or try to halt it, it will lose momentum. And uh, basically, this is the gradient of the pressure. So you have, you have a thing there. And somehow, uh, you put a piston, and the fluid is moving this way. You put a piston here, the fluid is being obstructed um, like that. And this is the viscosity. This is the viscosity, and you have the gradient term here. Uh, in fact, a Laplacian kind of thing. And this term, we relate to second gradients, is just trying to slow one fluid layer uh, against the next layer, etc. Now, uh, therefore, each term has a certain meaning. And normally, suppose I have a flow which is oscillating so rapidly and moving very slowly, let's say, then you can imagine all its momentum is in the oscillatory part, right? So that means this term is the largest part and the rest of it may not be so large. On the other hand, let's say the flow is steady, more or less, that means this term is sort of negligible and its momentum change is happening because of three things. One is moving from here to a neighboring re region where the momentum is different, right? It's like you move to a rich location and you sort of become rich yourself in other people's estimation. And um, then uh, the pressure gradient can give you momentum and the viscosity can take away the momentum of the fluid. Therefore, if you want to know which of the mechanisms is most dominant, the, con the usual thing to do is to take a ratio of this term to another term, this term to that term, etc. right? For example, if I take the ratio of uh, the unsteady term to, uh, to this term here, uh, u d u d x, somehow I have to make the estimates, which I will tell you how we do it. So then you can say, um, this term is negligible, or you can keep this term, and your equation becomes simpler, and you can solve it uh, in using simpler techniques. It turns out in fluid dynamics, the most important factor is the ratio of this term to this term. This is telling you how much the momentum is changing as a function, of, as a result of its, its uh, bodily motion, and this term on the right is telling you how it's losing as a result of the frictional forces. So uh, if I have, therefore, u du dx is the, this is the so-called inertia term. Uh, inertia um, related to advection, simply moving, you know, motion related thing. And it's like uh, Newton's first law, everything that is moving will keep moving, which is inertia, and that's the connection. And um, then I have here nu d squared u over dx squared. So that's the comparison I have to make. Now, let's uh, imagine a situation where I have a little object like that, flowing like this, and this is the velocity u, and this is length l, okay? Now, typically, du dx, this term, is rate of change of velocity along the horizontal direction. That means velocity changes by about that amount in a distance of that order. Because the velocity here is u, 
And the velocity there is essentially zero on the surface, and it becomes 2u here, I'm 3u or some, 2u maybe. Uh, like that, it, it's something you should uh, sort of know, but doesn't matter. So basically, u changes by, a mag by one order of magnitude, by one, uh, one value of this, in a distance of the RDL. It's typical, it's just a, not a very precise thing, but it is of that kind. So the order of magnitude of this is, is done like this. This u here, uh, which is velocity anywhere, is kind of of the order of the, this uh, mean velocity coming from there. And du dx is of the order of u over l. You see, velocity change of the order u takes place in a distance of order l. And now let's get to uh, this here. Again, the same argument, I have nu and I have u over l squared. So it's, this is not a good example for that, but that's basically the general idea. And then what do you have? I have here uh, u going there, and 1l cancels with that, and I have ul over nu. This l is coming upstairs, so I have that, and that's the Reynolds number. So Reynolds number simply says that the inertia forces to viscous forces is, uh, that's what it measures, if this is very large, um, that means the inertia forces are large generally, and typically you might be tempted to ignore that and do your calculations. So that's uh, the picture of that. Now, of course, Reynolds number is not how uh, reliable the interpretation of Reynolds number as inertia to viscous forces depends upon how good this estimate is, you see. Uh, maybe the velocity changes by, um, by, uh, by capital U, not in a distance x, but in a distance which is much smaller than x. Uh, similarly, the viscous forces, when I did this analysis here, I might not have, I should probably have used the thickness of the boundary layer here, which would have changed the whole thing. So uh, the meaning of that um, is always the same but when you think of it in quantitative terms, you really have to know exactly how it was defined, whether it's the right length to have chosen, the right velocity to have chosen, and that depends upon your physical intuition. If you know that, um, in this case, I have the cylinder, I have the little boundary layer sitting on it, that's another length, you know, it's like delta, let's say. Should I have used delta for this L? Um, for example, right? You don't know that until you know what the problem is going to be like, and generally, uh, that's where the real interpretation of the Reynolds number comes. Okay, so you shouldn't uh, you shouldn't be too concerned that it's five thousand in one case, ten in another case, etc. But basically, larger it is defined in a certain way, the more important the inertial. Uh, effects will be. Can we have a Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, again, it depends upon how you define the Reynolds number. For example, in this case, suppose for my definition of the Reynolds number, I took the velocity here, not some average velocity that I'm pumping it in, then the Reynolds number will be changing according to the profile. Likewise, for instance, why should I be using the pipe diameter? Maybe I should use uh, the uh, length of the pipe, or I should use the length of the pipe up to the point where I am measuring the profile here. So if I do it here and here, the Reynolds number here will be twice as much as the Reynolds number there. So that's why you, um, Reynolds number always, one says Reynolds number based on and that base down is supposed to tell you uh, what you are talking about in general. There can be global Reynolds number, local Reynolds numbers, and some length scales you can create which are very different from the obvious physical length scales um, and things like that. So it means if the momentum is haphazard with respect to space, then 
global the importance of global without so much increases uh, or it might decrease uh, because uh, because if you have local Reynolds number based on the thickness of the layers related to the random fluctuations, if maybe that is the important one for your problem. So the global Reynolds number may not tell you very, very much. So for example, we are all in the universe and the universe is expanding and you can say it has a certain global Reynolds number, but it doesn't mean anything for you if you are flying in the atmosphere uh, the Reynolds number that matters is the Reynolds number of the aircraft that is moving there. Uh, who cares about what the universe's Reynolds number is, right? Or if you are, let's say, a little um, uh, dust particle or a fly that has fallen into your water and the fly is trying to get out, um, that Reynolds number for it is based on the, its motion not on whether the whole river on which it has fallen is just moving or not, right? I mean, so uh, maybe that too is important in some way. So it, it depends. It really depends on what, uh, what you're after. But um, the basic notion that higher the Reynolds number, more important the inertial effects, is a qualitatively correct statement. Yeah. So if the Reynolds number in different places in the flow is different, then how do we, you know, what? Yeah. There I was talking about a global Reynolds number. So if you have a flow, and I am not uh, thinking of uh, further refinements, I'm just talking about the thickness of the uh, fluid layer, which may be the apparatus size, times uh, the velocity that is going through, and uh, all that. If I, yeah, so that's what I'm doing. And I will later on define other Reynolds numbers for us. Yeah, uh, I didn't exactly say that that is the most important one, but the one ratio that is almost always stated is that. Um, because in general, when you have a steady flow, this vanishes, and you can imagine flows which has no pressure gradient, that is, pressure is constant everywhere, and then I have just this kind of stuff. So, so generically, that is what one considers. Um, but um, in a flow like this, for instance, the pressure is always there, you know. Uh, this is, you have to push the fluid in order for it to go through the pipe. Um, right? Otherwise, it would not flow. And therefore, there's always a pressure gradient. It's always a question of which is stronger. And you would know that by, by making such comparisons. And pressure, in particular, is uh, related to uh, the velocity in some way, in, uh, in a strange way. Um, and you, do you know Bernoulli's equation? Yeah? Okay. So Bernoulli, for instance, tells you the pressure and uh, velocity are related to each other. I mean, it's a more energy um, statement on energy, but, um, but pressure and velocity are related. Although Bernoulli's equation does not always work, especially when you have viscosity, uh, right? It's only valid for uh, inviscid flows, but if the viscosity effects are small, you can imagine that it has some, um, some of the same uh, things. So you sort of don't take a pressure as a separate thing in order to compute another non-dimensional parameter. But there are instances where pressure becomes an independent variable unto itself. Um, um, and then you will have other numbers, Euler number and other things that you compute. What is the stationary liquid? Stationary liquid, it is zero. But sir, we know that we know very well that molecules inside of the ah. liquid are it's a very good point. So uh, the molecules are moving about, but the average is zero. See, uh, molecules are in random, unless you superimpose something on it, they have a distribution which is like a Gaussian. Uh, so there are um, as many molecules mo moving in the forward direction as there are in the backward direction and sideways as well. 
So it's all uh, boils down to zero. Uh, but it doesn't mean uh, my statement is only true in a, in a global sense. Um, so for example, I have a tank, I have a, a big tank like that, and the fluid is stationary. But let's say here, somehow, a little fly is moving about, okay? It's true that the Reynolds number for the whole apparatus is zero, but for the fly it is not. It's not because it has a certain size and it's moving about with a certain velocity and that's why it has to swim in order to keep against viscosity. So it has a Reynolds number. And in fact, in biology, for instance, um, the Reynolds numbers are always small. You have a cell that is in motion or a little animal that is in motion uh, but basically, except when you talk about uh, fl um, a flight of birds and, and big fish and things like that, I, uh, related to uh, molecular biology, everything has a low Reynolds number. So the phenomena there is very different from the phenomena in, uh, in aerodynamics and so on, because the Reynolds numbers are uh, usually uh, very small in biology. I mean, roughly speaking, it's... I have to say what in biology, but then you can ignore this term and you can simply have, you know, pressure gradient versus um, was viscous forces and you can calculate what the flow around the object is and how the object deforms as a result and things like that. But in general, um, in the aerodynamics and hydrodynamics of any sort, Reynolds numbers are relatively large. So, they, um, so when um, the many cases where the velocities are very small, you have a little sphere that is moving about, for instance, um, as, a, as a fly that is uh, moving about, for, as I said, or a cell. Uh, this is a very large part of uh, the world that we know, but we don't see always necessarily all of this in great detail. Uh, so there is a very important part relating to Reynolds numbers, very small, but there is no turbulence in them, uh, generally, because Reynolds numbers are small, inertia forces are small, and the perturbations die out because the viscosity is very high, relatively speaking, and so it is a case where there is usually no turbulence. Okay, yeah. By what? By PC. Ah, you can't. Uh, we can introduce turbulence, uh, tub, tub, uh, perturbation by time dependent factor and then calculate different effects. Yes, you can, but you can only, your PC has a certain capacity. That means you can use only a certain number of modes. And for those modes, it's perfectly fine for you to do that. And I will tell you uh, what kind of size of the computations are needed for what Reynolds number, et cetera, et cetera in the next uh, couple of lectures, something like that. But in principle, yeah, you can always do it. So now you go from a PC to uh, petaflop machines to whatever machines to exaflop machines, etc. And the idea has always been that you go to bigger and bigger uh, problems. That means you can include more and more modes. And the mode, the node numbers are related to the Reynolds number. I actually said that, but it was not very clear. So if you have a bigger scale and you have a smaller scale, so the bigger scale may be that, and the smaller scale may be that, okay? And this is uh, usually like that. Well, it may be even more than that, but. So if the Reynolds number is more, a large, then this ratio becomes large. Somehow, these become smaller and smaller, so you have to resolve them better and better. You have to include more and more modes, and your PC can't do that anymore and you have to go to a bigger computer, and then that too has a limit, etc. I want to see if he has finished. You're not happy somehow. You're not happy? Okay.
All right, fine, yeah, okay. Suppose we fool the system and we have very small length scale and very minute viscosity too. So then we can have Reynolds number of the order of uh, suppose 10 or 100 something. Yeah. And we can fool the system and we, can we sustain turbulence in there? Yeah. The um, turbulence doesn't care whether you fool the system one way or another. It only <laughs> wants to know what the Reynolds number is. That is, if you take a fluid with very small viscosity, then your little perturbation is good enough to create turbulence, okay? And in fact, that is how you do that in uh, using uh, helium and things like that. So, the whole idea is the size itself uh, does not matter. The magnitude of viscosity itself does not matter. But what matters is the ratio, the ratio. And if you have, um, for example, let's say honey, uh, which has very high viscosity, to get, get turbulence, you really have to spin faster. Uh, otherwise, it's not going to become turbulent. But if you have water which has less viscosity, you can stir at normal pace and you have turbulence. If you take helium, which is even lower viscosity, you don't have to stir like that at all. It will, um, it's just a tiny bit of perturbation and it'll maintain, uh, maintain turbulence. So it's all dependent on that. You're not happy with that? Yeah, turbulence is the complex motion of a fluid. Um, now, you can keep the motion complex by stirring it a complex way. You can always do that. But the generic form of turbulence is you don't stir it in a very complicated way. You stir it in a simple way. And then somehow the fluid itself becomes complex in motion. And how, how does it do that? That's the whole game. The game is to think that you haven't really, um, in the atmosphere, nobody has stood up and shaken the flow uh, always. Nobody shakes it to give you the wind velocity that is fluctuating. Somehow what's happened is there is a big pressure gradient across the whole range from uh, Arabian Sea to Bay of Bengal or something. And then you have the whole motion across Indian subcontinent and with rain and uh, winds and everything. Now how does that happen? How does it happen without forcing? Yeah, uh, okay, uh, this is another story. But basically, I will, I will tell you a bit more about it. Um, I, I, roughly speaking, <coughs> excuse me, it's fluctuating relatively rapidly in time. And in space as well, it is not, uh, it's, it's also fluctuating. So it's something here and something there, uh, not exactly the same anyhow and it's also fluctuating here. What is now and what is later is not the same, etc. So that's, that's a, it can be very simple, but it's very complicated. That is, there is no repeatable um, character in it. Okay. Suppose we take a watering tank. Yes. It doesn't matter how much we give it energy, yeah. ultimately it will settle down, sir. Then how much energy is needed to create turbulence in this water? If you shake it half, ultimately after one, one hour, two hours, it will settle down. Yeah, in that case, uh, you're right. So, if you have a tank that is sitting still uh, and you stir it, after a while it will uh, die. If you stir it harder, it will take longer, but it will eventually die. And, uh, but that is not true of all cases. That's the point. The point is, uh, the, in the tank in which you are doing the stirring, the basic state has a velocity equal to zero everywhere because it is sitting there, no velocity in it. Now you stir it, that is your perturbation, okay? So when the perturbation dies, it comes back to its original state. So there is no mechanism by which the fluctuation can take energy from the basic state essentially here. But here, the velocity is 
not uniform and there is are not zero, it is a certain value. And these flows are more prone to giving away energy to the perturbation and letting them grow. But in this case, it is absolutely true that um, because of this condition here, the flow is simply not able to give any energy to the perturbation and the perturbations by. So it means that in this case, because we can't get turbulence. Uh, you can create turbulence as long as you keep stirring. Once you stop stirring, it will die away. So, but if we in, instead of stirring, we increase its temperature mm -hmm. and maintain that temperature, then sir, it will in random motion all the chunks of the fluids. Then in that by that way, we can create turbulence. Now, you are talking about random motion of molecules. Random motion of molecules doesn't translate to random motion of fluid particles. I'm interested in fluid particles because that's the concrete uh, thing I, am in, I have in mind. So, fluid, part, uh, fluid molecules, I mean the molecules of the gas or liquid, they always move about in random way. But I'm interested in knowing whether the aggregate, that is, you know, you average out the whole thing, Second whether course. that is, mis you think of it like that. Think of it like that. Ask whether that's moving or not. In this case, can't we say that gravity is playing some role? Yeah, gravity would play a role. And uh, the answer that I gave you, uh, that it would eventually return, is only partly correct. Of course, if you have a gravitational uh, change here, then it could sustain itself as well. Because then a gravitational change, um, uh, can itself lead to some other way of uh, distributing energy. Yeah, we have to talk about that. Uh, uh, here, I have a question there. Yeah. Uh, what do you want me to talk about? Two are related. Yeah, I made some remarks this morning. I don't know whether you were here or not. You were here. Yeah, um, that's a little bit a longer question. Maybe uh, the others are not that interested. Let's talk about it. Let me answer this question. Maybe it's shorter, and then I'll come back to it. Uh, sorry. Yeah. So, so by giving this rank example, so does it mean that production term like energy change equation means other term perturbation energy are giving some source of energy, whether it is like flow or so, in this case, it means that the production in the long run uh, turns out to be zero, and uh, all, uh, the viscosity uh, kills off all gradients, so it smooths it out, and eventually it will come to zero. So, that's what it means. It's a continuous phenomenon. I mean, that's what I want to continually want to tell you. That's a continu continuous continuum phenomenon, as they call it. So there is a fluid particle, which is um, an agglomeration of many molecules, uh, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands or whatever, and you average over them, uh, what properties does that aggregate have? That's the one that matters most in uh, normal, normal circumstances, because um, you want to know what a fluid velocity is here on the aircraft wing, in order to know how much load it produces, and that is not all related. I mean, it's all ma molecules in the end. Uh, in the end, it's all quantum mechanics, but you don't want to go to that level all the time. Um, so let me answer this question of uh, bifurcations and so on. So I made uh, the following uh, remark uh, this morning, and that is that a typical way in which uh, the a system can become unstable um, is by um, a perturbation growing and becoming itself stable. Um, for example, in, uh, in a phase space where I have velocity in one coordinate and the position in the other coordinate, um, it may be more than two-dimensional, but basically, then a stable system will always be a point in that space. Velocity is zero, and um, the position is whatever it was, okay? So, 
uh, in the in the phase space of uh, momentum and uh, and position, um, the fixed point there is the stable point for the for the system. Now you perturb it. Uh, this is very schematic. Okay, you perturb it by putting a sinusoidal wave, and the sinusoidal wave grows, and it's it's sort of stabilized to a certain magnitude. What it means is so. Let, let me go back here. So if you have uh, the the uh, the point as the as the stable um, for, uh, stable indicator of the system status, what it means is any perturbation will die away and give you the same status. In phase space, what you do is you put a little, you perturb the system from its original position or give you additional velocity, it will always come back there. Okay, So you put it here, it will come back there. You put it there, it will come back there, it will come back there. So the attractor here is just a point in phase space. So all the uh, the system is always attracted to the same same position. But now, if you perturb the flow a little bit or the system a little bit, and then it grows initially and then it becomes that, then the this is represented by a limit cycle. Limit cycle means that the the attractor is now a circle because any position you, uh, any perturbation you make from there is going to this periodic state. So if you're there, it will go there, you know, like that. So, so from here to here is a, is a per bifurcation, bifurcation that has taken place from a, a periodic state to a limit cycle. And how does this happen? It happens uh, through something like that. The initial perturbation just grows, and then you have this this kind of uh, this kind of thing. And um, uh, technically, you represent it like this. This is um, some parameter which you have moved from here to here. Um, I don't know some parameter, let's say, and you write the amplitude of the uh, system there um, when the everything uh, comes to zero. The amplitude is zero, so it is zero up to a certain uh, value of the parameter. That is, you perturb it, it will always come back to the zero state, or the ground state, or basic state. And after that, it will change. It will change to a limit cycle, whose amplitude depends upon how far along you are, you are here, and it may do that. So then, if you are here, the amplitude will be, this. the saturation amplitude will be that, like that, and this is a bifurcation, and this is a square root bifurcation, like what I said earlier, p minus p star to the power half. Uh, this is p star, let us say. You remember what I wrote that amplitude a is Reynolds number minus Reynolds number uh, to the power half. That is the same kind of thing. So it's a bifurcation, like that. This is uh, called the half bifurcation. But now you have here another system which is that, and this you can perturb. You can uh, perturb that system in a different way. And then what it will do is, it will also become another limit cycle with another frequency superimposed on it. And that is the two torus I wrote uh, very quickly there. It will be like a donut uh, like that, and the trajectories instead of going around here will go around this uh, two torus like that. So that's another half bifurcation which will be something like that, you know. So here it becomes unstable, and this becomes stable, this is all unstable. And another bifurcation, another like that. Yeah. So in chaos, uh, what usually happens is, the first few bifurcations like that, maybe two or three, depending on what uh, system you have, and then you have a very complex motion. Complex motion that is uh, temporally very complex, it uh, doesn't have any distinguishable periodicity to it. Or it may have, but it, the spectrum is continuous. Um, and uh, the motion is unpredictable. That is to say, you have uh, two points in phase space that are close together, and they uh, you know, depart exponentially. 
or um, in some cases if the, if the separation is large, they might even bifurcate algebraically. But well, that's what happens. Now in turbulence, um, the complexity is not only the temporal signal, that is the signal as a function of time has this complexity, but spatially it is complex. Um, okay, in dynamical systems, usually, um, usually one talks about temporal systems. For example, Lorentz attractor has no spatial structure to it. So temporal systems. What's that? Temporal, system? temporal means time. There is only d d t term in it. There is no d by d x and d by d y kind of thing. Lorentz system, you remember how simple it is. So. Um, that's the thing, that's the thing, main thing that uh, differentiates a turbulent flow from a chaotic um, a phenomenon is the additional spatial complexity that is associated with the turbulent flow. So the spatial complexity, I mean there are many other differences but this one major difference. And what happens in dynamical systems is usually you have a small number of degrees of freedom. There are, there are three degrees of freedom, five like that. But in turbulence, if you think of each of these particles of any interest to you uh, scales and think of how many scales you have of that sort in your box or in your flow apparatus, there are many, a large number of them. So when you have a large number of these degrees of freedom, it's not clear whether you have, you preserve the same characteristics of a dynamical system. Will the uh, trajectories um, diverge exponentially? Is the memory loss the same as you have in a dynamical system? Now all of that are difficult to answer. So there, there's some amount of similarity uh, between dynamical systems and turbulence in so far as the temporal complexity or time complexity uh, goes in terms of the basic unpredictability, et cetera, uh, but uh, it's quite different and quite more elaborate. If we talk about the point tractor in physics space, then yeah. we talk about some even directions. In which some say, what? Even directions. Yes. In yeah. which particles settle down minimum time. Yes. Then there is some time of even perturbation in this case. In a turbulent flow, what the eigen um, uh, functions are and the eigen modes are is not clear. You can actually decompose the motion in eigen functions and eigen modes, um, but they are not very simple. Yeah, that's a that's a important point. That uh, there are a lot of people who work on this kind of stuff. Yes. Yes. How can I get it? I didn't get it. Ah, you didn't get it. Uh, basically, what it, uh, what I was trying to say was, um, yeah, imagine a turbulent flow in your mind and freeze its motion in your head at any given time. And uh, again, take another picture of that a little bit later. Now, uh, the two are not going to be the same but they are not also going to be um, extremely different from each other because you have taken two frames of two pictures, you know, very closely apart. So you, therefore, there's a certain memory associated with the first frame that is, uh, you can see in the other. So there may be some large structure that has rotated only half the way, but on top of it, a lot of uh, superstructure imposed on it. So that's what I meant by uh, it preserving its memory. But it does not mean that the fluid has a memory. Um, you see the classical fluids like water and air do not have a memory. Uh, they respond to what you've done just now. They don't respond to what you did there yesterday. Um, that's true of turbulence as well uh, because most of the flows we are talking about concern fluids of um, a memory without any mem memoryless fluids. Uh, but in the sense of uh, preserving a structure and so on, it has a certain memory. For, a short time. for some time, I mean, for example, 
if you have a hurricane or uh, what do you call them here in, uh, um, what's the word, uh, cyclone. Cyclone, uh, I grew up with cyclone, but I somehow forget it. So if you have a cyclone, that cyclone persists for a long time. Um, that's also part of a turbulent system, if you like. So there are certain features of a turbulent flow that can persist for a very long time, and some that will die away very rapidly. That's uh, memory for different amounts of time. It doesn't depend on the fluid. It depends upon the fluid dynamical character of that sub object. Uh, is it a cyclone? Is it a monsoon? Uh, you know, I mean, you can see that that kind of thing will tell you a lot more than whether the rain is from uh, Arabian Sea or from Bay of Bengal, which has a separate density or a different density somewhat. So it doesn't depend on that as much. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that depends on the system, but if you take a period, a period doubling attractor, then the gap between the first instability and the next is larger than the gap between the second and the third and third and the fourth, and everything collapses so towards the end. Does it gets easier to, does it progressively get easier to like sort of, um, and Sort of add a perturbation, make it grow into another No, state. it doesn't become harder, uh, it becomes harder in my opinion. But the point is, um, everything collapses, there is a convergence, it's like a convergent series where um, every new thing um, is only adding a little bit. So there is a, everything eventually boils down to a certain number. Um, uh, because of the fast convergence of the various states that take place. Yeah. So, uh, uh, to, to say that uh, better, so if I have this perturbation here, it will take that long for it to lose stability, and it takes only that long, and the next one takes that long, and the next one that, you know, like that, and then you have infinity, all of infinite ones happening here somehow already. Yeah. Yeah. Motions on the torus. On the, on the torus. Are they generally stable? I mean, like, uh, they generally break apart easily due to a cancer. Well, uh, first of all, we are talking about dissipative systems, so KM theorem does not apply. Um, but they are stable and not stable. They are stable for a certain range of parameters and they become unstable uh, for after a certain uh, value of the parameter. Yeah. In case of uh, pitfall type of time to take yes. to occur in the two dimensions, yeah. so uh, you know you have one pitfall type to take followed by the other. Is it like similar in this forward until it becomes uh, unsteady and uh, well, with one bifurcation, it could become unsteady, um, but it does not become very complex. So, where is the point where you say that this is my REL? REL. Ah, uh, REL is very simple. This is my REL. The first time it starts to grow, that is my REL. That's very easy, easy to say. But what is not easy is where this RE. A T is, for instance, I mean, all these things have to accumulate to some some particular particular Reynolds number. And of course, I, I don't know exactly what that might be. Uh, this is a little vague, but I might uh, base it on uh, many considerations. Like I can see a visible uh, spot of turbulence that I can follow for some time or something like that. Yes. Yeah. I'm thinking where you might have multiple states. Um, it's it's possible. Um, it's definitely possible. Yeah. But then you will have you need some other other uh, 
parameter that tells you which path it follows and things like that. Um, it, it's, uh, see, it's possible because the kind of scenario I'm talking about, there are only a small number of forces. In particular, there are only two, which is the inertial and the viscous. I'm only using Reynolds number because of that. But suppose I had uh, um, magnetic force also attached to it. And then I have need another, another parameter to describe uh, the state of the flow. And it can be, you can control what happens in this plane by working off plane using something else. Yeah, you can have, you can have, I'm thinking of giving you an example, but I can't think of it. What's that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I have to think about that a bit. Um, so, uh, for example, that's a good one. Um, and uh, wake behind a cylinder, for instance, uh, has oscillations, and uh, somehow it can take uh, one of two states sometimes. And you will need something else. You will need a little bit different from, see, for example, um, so wake behind a cylinder, usually it has this kind of structure, uh, but if you put a plate here or something like that, uh, then it can totally change the structure, and you pull the plate back a little bit, it will bring it back, you know, things like that. I mean, you need some other control parameter in addition to just Reynolds number. So that, that could happen, yeah. 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 Why does the critical parameters and the difference? Why does it shrink? Yeah. Well, why it shrinks, I don't know. But um, that's generally what happens because I guess in general, uh, if you are here, your basic state is very simpler, very simple. You get here, the basic state is a little bit more complex because you have the first basic state plus the perturbation superimposed on it. But if you are here, you have this basic state plus this perturbation and this perturbation, etc. So you go here, you have already got a very many-dimensional system, and a many-dimensional system behaves very differently from a from a uh, single-dimensional system. And I can imagine, therefore, that it could lose its uh, stability much more easily than than uh, a single-dimensional one. But um, why is always a very hard question to answer in science. And in general, I suppose um, one person can maintain control uh, under very difficult conditions, but if you have a crowd, I guess it's much harder. I mean, I don't think it's a good example. <laughs> a politician can sway the crowd very fast. When we were talking about oscillations of turbulence, we talked about the expansion of one by R. Uh, um, it's too technical uh, for us to discuss it, but basically, uh, wh what does one do in any uh, uh, analysis uh, where you have a system and you have just moved it a little bit, um, and what you do is think of that as a little perturbation, and you put all your analysis uh, together, and you always have uh, some small parameter in the problem. So you have a basic system, you have moved it to a new, system, new state a little bit, and the difference in the two states becomes your perturbation parameter. So for example, uh, you are, let's say, studying um, a flow in compressible flows, uh, and you have Mach number of uh, three or something, and you want to go to a slightly higher Mach number. You know what the situation is, the shock structure is for Mach number three, you want to put calculate 3.2, you can usually do by perturbation analysis. And uh, here, you can't do perturb... So Reynolds number is our parameter. You might think that something connected with Reynolds number is a, is a perturbation parameter. And people have tried to obtain the turbulent state by using Reynolds number as an expansion parameter. You cannot do that in principle because already the parameter is very large and, you know, uh, 
and turbulence being a high Reynolds number phenomenon, it's very hard to do perturbation in Reynolds number. But 1 over Reynolds number or 1 over log Reynolds number could be a small parameter uh, and therefore you might be able to do certain types of expansions using those parameters and they seem to work for a certain range of properties. I mean it's not a, not a panacea for everything. And now I'm getting an idea of what kinds of things I should say and I'm getting very anxious now <laughs> as to what I should say the next time. Um, so how do I do that? I mean I wanted to write the equations and tell you all about the structure of the equations. I'm not sure I want to do that anymore. Should I do that? Let, let me do that and see what happens. Uh, let's have the uh, maybe the same principle that is I give my uh, talk in the morning and in the afternoon uh, let's spend like this uh, answering any questions you may have. Is that okay? Yeah. So you sort of uh, prepare your questions for me a little bit uh, ahead of time during the lunch or something like that. That gives you some time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now I know at least I have to say. Yeah. Yes. And a perturbation, space perturbation, suppose a hill. Yes. Hill acts as a space perturbation. Yes. And then this perturbation will uh, rise in terms of in one mode. After uh, after some time, it will become in, uh, in another mode. The court, yeah. Uh, it yeah. can now rise in, uh, in another mode. Right. It means for modeling. Atmosphere, yes. what will be happen? We need to place sensor at every point where we think that can be perturb our atmosphere. Well, depends on what you want to do. Suppose you want to study the effect of, let's say, Western Ghats on the wind that comes off Arabian coast, something like that, or you want uh, there are no Eastern Ghats anymore, so not that much. So let's say a wind comes from Bay of Bengal and you have these ghats somewhere and you want to know what it will do. Um, now it's a slightly different problem from turbulence but still I think can answer the question. It's slightly different because you have a very well organized structure that you are looking at, not a, you know, multiples of perturbations. Um, but I can still answer the question. Uh, so you want to know whether the monsoons that are uh, receding for you will hit the, my district in the uh, southern part of India, something like that. So then you have to really put your instrumentation in the uh, southern part of uh, India where I am I'm from. But if you want to get a causal connection, then you have to uh, measure them near where you put in the perturbation, that is where the guards are near where I am and in the neighboring areas to understand what everything else is doing. So it's an instrumentation of the whole space in some sense that is connected with it. That's what I have to do. This type of perturbation in air uh, will take how much time to be constable? Depends. Um, as I said, if you have a cyclone, uh, it's born one day, it stays there for three or four days until everybody gets sick and then it will die. Uh, it's not exactly related to that, but basically it will die a few days later. Uh, but if you have, uh, say, uh, the temperature as a result of monsoon rains or something, uh, at least in my part of uh, the country, um, they might last half an hour, the rain, but the temperature change will be, will be seen immediately and for some time. So it all depends on the phenomenon you are talking about. Um, so likewise in a turbulent flow, um, different structures will decay uh, at different times uh, depending on their amplitude, depending upon their uh, physical, uh, their shape in physical domain, all of that. So it's that, that's why it is a complex. You have to be able to make all these statements um, uh, as much as possible in a 
a generic way and that is not so easy. So, uh, I had uh, Professor Rama Govindrajan make a copy of this thing. I, I only wanted one copy, but I probably was not clear in what I tried to tell her. Um, so, this is uh, from Picasso. Uh, and uh, that's the bull, the one at the bottom. And the idea was to um, make it into, let's say, get the gist of a bull, okay? How, how can you simplify the bull so that you will never mistake it for anything else, but it is really as simple as possible? This is what physicists do all the time, right? They don't solve the problem as it exists, but they try to make a spherical curve as you have heard many times. But the idea is not to make it a spherical bull because then you don't recognize it. But how do you, what is it that you want to make it, uh, uh, you know, how do you, how do you make it so simple that you can actually do something, but on the other hand, not so diverse from reality that it uh, makes no connection, whatever. So you know what uh, Picasso's uh, solution was? Uh, it, this is a very famous thing. Uh, of course, in going from top to bottom, you simplify some things and if you have a keen eye exaggerating some things, but I will let you figure out which he was exaggerating. <laughs> and then uh, came uh, this, the third one, and came the, the one on the top. The top one is uh, essentially as simple as you can make it, but still you can't mistake it for anything else. You sort of know it is a bull, right? I mean, more or less. You can say it's a cow or you can say, depending upon your predilections, but basically it is that kind of animal. And uh, if you take this off, you know that an important part is missing. You take these off, you know some important part is missing. And then you will not know, you will not even recognize. Without this, you see, you don't know what you are looking at. So the whole business of uh, doing science, in particular physics, um, is try to construct something like this out of something like the one at the bottom. In biology, of course, that kind of thing does not necessarily work, so it's a little bit more complicated. And even there, people are always looking for things like this. So, um, uh, that's what we all should do, and that's what uh, we try to do in every part of science. And what I will also say is, I'll try to cut the bull to its, its uh, minimal <laughs> form. But still, I have to have the horns, I have to have the tail, I have to have the legs, you know, without it, you, you won't even recognize what it is. I just wanted this one copy, but if you're interested, um, Rama was very kind to have many copies made. You can take one of these. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, I was not clear. I should have uh, been. I didn't even say for students. I said for the class this afternoon. But it might have sounded to you like the entire class, and I meant only one copy. I was not clear. My mistake. Okay, so we'll meet uh, tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, you have to speak a little slower for me. Ah. That's right. Well, uh, if you close uh, the thing one side, there won't be any flow in the first place. There won't be any steady flow through it. And uh, a fluid particle can do that, for instance. What might happen is, um, to close this, it, it might be that you might have flow like that and you might have flow backwards like that, right? That you can have. So if you put a particle there, it will follow this and it will move back. So its velocity is not zero. But if you take the average over the entire cross section, the velocity is zero. So it, it depends on what you mean. If you take the average of this, things that are moving there and things that are moving backwards cancel out. Likewise, anything else cancels out. And, uh, the fluid particle on, it, on a trajectory like that can, can go. Uh, 
in if, if the flow is organized like that. Of course, if this is closed, then there is really no flow, and then everything is stationary, and then every fluid particle is zero, so sitting still. Mm. Yes? Zero, yeah. What do you mean? The speed is increased, but the fluid is not moving. No, no, observer is always sitting still. Uh, he, she is not moving, the observer. She is sitting still. The fluid is moving past the observer. It's a fixed frame of reference, Eilerian frame of reference, where you're sitting there and observing what's happened to the flow. It might be that you want to ride on the particle. That's another story. You might want to jump on the particle and then follow the particle, but that's uh, something that we will do later on. Ah, I, don't, I don't understand your ambiguity. In that case, there is no motion and therefore there is no turbulent motion. See, I, um, I, have, I have a pipe, one side closed, and I want to push the fluid, it's not moving anywhere, right? Unless you compress it. And that's a, uh, that's a stationary problem of compression of the fluid. So, um, if I have the fluid moving and then suddenly close it, that's another story. Then what happens is there's a fluid in motion and uh, it's blocked now. Then what was moving has to somehow come down to zero velocity. It'll take some time and it'll equilibrate and it'll, it'll vanish. That is like a perturbation you put in by hitting the wall altogether, closing it. But otherwise, there is no flow if you just put a pipe like the, uh, I don't know what kind of things. Um, I've forgotten many of the Indian words, but now you don't have a flow. Okay, I think uh, we should stop. Okay, all right. See you tomorrow. Thanks a lot.